know the rock. We're about to go into the second half of the evening, which is the International Speech Contest. And once again, if you used your phone while you were out, you know what you have to do, right? <laughs> Turn your phone back off and put it on vibrate uh, to show respect for the contestants as they give their presentation. Again, I'd like to bring up our Toastmaster again, Melissa Newport.
and the only thing that looked good was Miss South Africa, May 2010, in my Toastmaster magazine. <laughs> Her smile would just light up my day. It would take me to a place where I imagined as if I was on a stage similar to this one, helping, saving, and transforming lives. But every piece of dust represented my faded dreams of becoming a professional speaker. See, that's when the phone rang. Hello? Now, I remember that the person that was on the caller was speaking very quickly, as if they were drowning in a lake, gasping for air. It was Phoenix. Now, Phoenix was a 25-year young girl who traveled all the way from Ghana because she had dreams of directing movies. But her father wanted her to study business instead. But Phoenix had failed the entrance exam. So why would she be calling me? And then the phone got really hot on my face when she began to whisper, Dwayne, my father says that I'm a failure. And I just can't take it anymore. I want to die. Now, I wanted to say lies, but I didn't want to do it literally. <laughs> now, what would you do if you were on that phone? What would you say? What would Miss South Africa had say? <laughs> I don't know. I never got past the cover on that matter. <laughs> but I knew I had to say something that would inspire this talented but tormented young woman. So I asked her, I said, I thought about her love for movies. I said, Phoenix, have you ever seen a movie called The Wizard of Oz? And she said, yes, but what does that have to do with anything? Well, you see, I knew that this movie was very important because the central character, Dorothy, picture this. She's absorbed in an enormous whirlwind and it propels her far away from where she wants to go. And it takes her to a land called Oz. And the only thing that Dorothy wants is to get back home. Dorothy dreams of making it to a place where the grass bends and Selena, and where every single raindrop that falls has a meaning. But Dorothy just couldn't get home. And see, I believe that like Dorothy, that we all have a dream. We all have a desire. But very few of us actually follow our yellow brick road to pursue our passions. I told Phoenix, I said, Phoenix, if you really believe in your dream of being a movie director, then I believe the best movie that you can direct is the movie of your life. You see, in the movie of your life, you are the director. You can control every scene. But the moment that you forget that you can write the script is when your epic adventure can quickly turn into a sad tragedy. I remember telling, I told Phoenix, I said, I believe you owe the world a better script than a life story that ends in tragic suicide. And then I shared with her something that my mother shared with me. I said, in the end, all living will die. But death is not the ultimate tragedy. The ultimate tragedy is to come to that fateful day only then to realize that you have never really lived. And all of a sudden, the phone became silent. And then I heard a loud pop. I feared the worst had happened. 
I remember looking at my trembling hand. And all of a sudden, I heard her voice, her trembling voice, slowly say, Dwayne, that was so inspiring. I dropped the phone on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> she said, thank you for helping me realize there are no bad days. There are only poorly practiced scenes. At the end of that day, Phoenix helped me realize that we don't need a stage to be a director. But what we can do is we can live our lives and sit in the director's chair that our lives present to us. Sometimes I wonder if there is a little phoenix in each of us, a deep-seated desire to follow our passions. And if you're afraid, to live your dreams, I encourage you. If you can't fly, then run. And if you can't walk, then crawl, no matter what it takes. And find your way to your director's chair and live your life. Mr. Toastmaster. Our next contestant this evening will be Linda O'Neill. Her speech is titled, Does It Soothe? Does It Soothe? Linda O'Neill.
that Elvis and others have been blessed with and have been cursed with. Music, does it soothe the savage beast in us? I'm gonna ask once again that you would please close your eyes. This time I want everyone to close their eyes. But continue to listen. You used to tell me we'd run away together. Love gives you the right to be free. You said be patient, just wait a little longer. But that's just an old fantasy. Again, please keep your eyes closed and someone tell me who that melodic, angelic voiced artist is who gave us that hit. Yes, you may open your eyes. That was I submit to you, the queen of pop, soul, and R&B, Whitney Elizabeth Houston. Fame, fortune, domestic violence, and drug abuse. Yes, these words as well represent the ups and the downs that so many iconic superstars have been blessed with and cursed with. When we listen to their music, does it soothe the savage beast of being judgmental within us? Pointing an accusing finger, shaking a disappointed head, Ranting and raving, how could they? They have it all, they have fame, they have fortune. If I had all of that, I would just, I, I would never. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and once all of the blah, blah, blahs die down to a hush with all of the spume disdain, what do we do? We go to the music. Yes, the music does soothe us. It soothes the savage beast of being judgmental that rises up within us. When we focus on the music, it heals our contempt. It heals our feeling of being let down. Wouldn't this world be a better place a more gentle and kind place if the average Joe or the average Jane could catch that same kind of break from us? I submit to you, yes. Oh, yes, then can real, true healing and recovery prevail rather than certain death. Madam Toastmaster.
Our next contestant this evening will be Elizabeth Piddlecow. Her speech is entitled, Get in the Basket, Get in the Basket, Elizabeth Piddlecow.
It transferred itself into my core and set a fire inside of me that is still alive to this day. Can you feel it? I have faced a fear, and although it was incredibly scary, it was also incredibly rewarding. We all face fears that seem too scary to try at first. Whether it's changing a career, joining an organization, or even public speaking. The first step is to get in the basket. Once you set the actions into motion, you will be amazed at the worlds you can experience. What baskets are waiting for you? I wear my air balloon attire to represent all of the fears I have overcome since that air balloon ride. I told myself to get in the basket when I moved to Chicago, and I told myself again to get in the basket when I joined Toastmasters. Both were extremely scary at the time, <laughs> especially Toastmasters. <laughs> but I cannot imagine who I would be today without them. Where are you from? And more importantly, where do you want to go? I am from Central Illinois. And where I am going is further into those skies. And I ask you to take the journey with me. Let us seek out the balloons of opportunity in our lives and take that first important step together to get in the basket. That is awesome. person, 
I invariably think of schizophrenia. As I said, my mom and my brother both suffer from schizophrenia. I didn't know what it was at first. I just knew that my brother acted really strange from an early age. He would talk and argue with people that weren't there. He would make up stories, pretend he was somebody else, and it wasn't a, an acting game. He actually believed he was there. My mom has had hallucinations where she thought that a man with red eyes was looking at her, telling her to jump out of the window, to cut herself, and it took all of her strength not to do it. We used to have a little bar, plastic, on the side in the corner of our, our living room. We had like little wine, and at night, my mom would look at that and think it was an eight-headed snake. I didn't see anything. It was a bar. But because of her illness, she thought it was an eight-headed snake. For my mother, the primary way that schizophrenia affects her is through smell. It affects and alters all of our senses. What you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you taste, what you feel and touch. Imagine not knowing if what you saw, or what you smelled, or what you touched was really there. Schizophrenics can make up a whole world solely in their brain, live in that world, talk to people in that world. My mom feels that there is a horrible odor, odor coming out of her body. Whenever we're in public, she thinks if someone sneezes or coughs, that it's because they're smelling her, her old odor. She hears someone saying, oh, it smells, it smells, it smells. Nobody said anything, but that's what she hears. Imagine living like that. She doesn't want to offend anybody. And the thought of having a smell coming out of her body, bothering someone, is just an awful, awful feeling. No matter how many times I tell her, that there is no odor, she doesn't believe me. She'll ask me, do I smell? Do you smell anything? And if I tell her no, she'll say, well, you're my daughter, so you're used to it. You can't smell anything. I don't believe you. It breaks my heart. She has bought every kind of soap, body wash, that you can imagine. She watches television, QVC, HSN, and whenever there is something, a body wash, that she thinks might help with her odor, she calls me right away and says, can you find this? I think this will be the trick. This will do it. I've had to fool her. She's asked me, call my doctor and ask my doctor if there's some kind of wash that I could, could use. And I lied and said, yes, I'll call your doctor and I'll go to Walgreens and I'll find a body wash and I'll give it to her and say, your doctor said you should have this. And it calms her down. For me, I am a shy introvert. I always have been. I'm responsible. I'm dependable. So my role in my household with the two schizophrenics was to be calm, to be the mother. Our roles are reversed. Even to this day, sometimes my mom will call me ma'am. So I never had a childhood. 
never. And I thought that that was all there was going to be. I taught myself to be calm. I've had people all my life tell me, show more emotion. Show that you're passionate about something. In speech evaluations, I've been told that. Show your emotion. But understand, living in a household with two schizophrenics, not knowing what's going to happen, what they're going to say, who they're going to see, someone had to hold the fort. Someone had to be calm. And so I taught myself to speak in a level voice. Non-threatening presence. Calm. To alleviate any issues that may come up. To calm them down. Now don't misunderstand. Underneath that calm is a bucket of feelings. Anger that this is my life, or has been, that I couldn't have fun like I saw other people, children do my age, that I had to be responsible. But now, my mom is 71, and she's on a medication that's helping to alleviate her symptoms. They will never go away. Schizophrenia is a lifelong illness. But she's able to be independent, to do what she needs to do for herself. She calls me every day, depending on what's going on, 20 times a day, and I'm lucky enough to have a job that allows me to be able to do that. But we have fun. I'm still her mom, in a sense. But schizophrenia has taught me compassion has taught me to understand people that are different than me. And I hope, just a little bit, listening to me speak about it, something that you may never have thought of, that when you see someone walking down the street, think about what they're going through in their mind. And I know you'll have Final contestant this evening is Gary Barnes. His speech is entitled Stand Up. Stand Up, Gary Barnes. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and distinguished guests, remember high school? For some, it was probably a blast from start to finish. For most, it was a time of awkwardness and adjustment. Yet, we survived fairly well. For a few, it was a time of alienation and isolation. They were the ones who got teased and picked on. In other words, it was the pit. 
Yes, we all saw it, didn't we? It was bullying then, and it's bullying now. I'd like to share an experience from high school that I hope can change our perspectives towards the mentality of bullying so common today. It was in 10th grade at a small school. The popular kids were Jerry and Bruce. Boy, they cool. Everyone wanted to be their friend. The best athlete was Charles. We all wanted to be on Charles' team in gym class. He was good at every sport, and he had a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> I was one of the so-called smart kids, kind of nerdy. I got teased sometimes, but I got along all right for the most part. Then there was Randall. Randall was the quiet type. He mostly kept to himself. Much of the time, he looked kind of weird. But he wasn't bad looking, really. Rather, he was gangly and uncoordinated. He didn't seem too swift, either. Typically, his homework wasn't ready to hand in. He couldn't give a decent answer in class to save his life. You get the picture, right? <laughs> Loser! <laughs> of course, Randall got teased and harassed a lot. I can't say I did harass him sometimes, too. Mostly, though, I just ignored him. To me, he was a doofus. I didn't want to associate with a doofus. No way! One day, though, something happened that changed my outlook. It was right after school on a warm spring day. Gym class was our last period. We had been playing soccer, so we were all pretty sweaty. There were two showers in the locker room. If you weren't one of the first ones back, you were going to have a cold shower. Naturally then, it wasn't unusual for guys to just get dressed and leave. Hey, it was last period. Now, Randall's locker was over by the popular kids, away from mine. On this particular day, I could hear Jerry and Bruce razzing him again. They were saying, Randall boy, you stink. Why don't you take a shower? Use some soap, too. Get away from me. They kept it up, despite his protest. Meanwhile, I got dressed quickly and headed out to the bike rack, minding my own business. No sooner did I get there than Randall comes out of the locker room stumbling with Charles behind, shoving him and hollering, Get out of here, Randall, or I'll kick your stinking butt. I'm unlocking my bike chain. They're on the other side of the bike racks. Charles is slapping him around, and Randall's whimpering. That's when I got fed up with it. So I said loudly, knock it off, Charles. He looked over at me. What did you say? I said, cut it out. Leave him alone. What are you going to do, he snapped. He took a step toward me. You want to fight me? <laughs> I was a scrawny beanpole. <laughs> he was maybe 20 pounds heavier, all muscle. My fists were clenched, but I only said, no, you just need to stop picking on people bigger than you. And then I added, or I'll get a teacher. <laughs> he glared at me a moment, then pointed a finger at my face. You better not mess with me again, kid, or I'll beat you up too. And he stalked back in the locker room. <laughs> I looked over at Randall, who said weakly, Thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> now, please, don't think of this as a happy ending. Randall and I didn't get to be best buddies after that. Hey, he was
was still a doofus. <laughs> it wasn't the last time he got bullied either, but not by Charles anymore. It doesn't matter. The point is, someone stood up to the bullying and got it stopped, at least for that moment. More importantly, my attitudes toward bullying were changed, and I found the courage to challenge it. Now, I know that things are a lot different these days for kids in high school and middle school. Those with awkward physical abilities, weak social skills, and unattractive appearance are at greater risk of bullying than ever, it seems. As adults, we need to work at changing this situation. But it takes confident kids who dare to stand up to <coughs> bullying. That depends on their values and their upbringing. And that begins with the family. Please, talk with your kids, your younger relatives, about bullying. Teach them to be compassionate towards those weaker than or different from themselves. Mentor them and monitor them too for any signs of bullying either to them or by them physically, socially, especially online. Help them stand up and stop the bullying now. Madam Toastmaster.
Madam Toastmaster, all ballots have been collected. Thank you. 
up here as well. What club are you from and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I am with uh, Club 9584, successfully speaking. Yay. 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 I've been a Toastmaster uh, for about a year. Okay. And you're working on your CC and CL as well? I am. Okay. Fantastic. Now it says here that you enjoy home improvement. There. It does. <laughs> Somebody else right here. Crunching numbers. Crunching numbers. 
Uh, I work as a quantitative analyst, so literally I get paid to crunch numbers, so you know, using whatever software you have. My point is, uh, it's not the technical side of number crunching, I enjoy the other side, which is, uh, why is the traffic so bad on Wednesday? I mean, it's not Friday, but <laughs> Why is the internet slow at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? So, this is the kind of number crunching that I like to do. I don't, I don't come up with answers, but I just like to crunch. <laughs>
Department of Irish. Okay. And what educational awards are you working on right now? I am aiming to finish my Triple Crown this week. Thank you. 
Was it young? Yeah. 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 She has the hookup. Woo. Also, something else that no one probably has noticed, but um, Tim Bolger, I'll be your rapper for this evening. He has this event here. Um, you can talk to him afterwards. Okay. This will not be out on the internet or anything else until after the conference. So if you want to get a copy of this, you can definitely talk to him. So, and if you have any type of events or something that makes sure that you probably hold in personal to your heart, you can also talk to him as well. Right. Because he does you. that work as well. Now, for the moment that we've all been waiting for, yeah. that's the contest results. And what I want to do is I want to talk, well, I want my two highest dignitaries in the room, <laughs> Cal Rody and Madam John Moore, to help me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start off with the table topics. Coming in third place, can I get a drum roll, please? A third place winner, Dan McCartney. the gentleman who left, correct? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf, Gary, on behalf of Central South, 
We thank each and every one of you to share your evening with us this evening. This contest is concluded. Have a great evening.